sorry, I'm okay, I'm fine. I just kicked the pulpit, everything's good. Um, so the title of the lesson today is Appreciate God's People. So the Apostle Paul writes this letter to Philippians and he begins by giving his thanks for God's people. He expresses his love and devotion for God's people and uh, gives a little prayer at the end of this uh, paragraph that we're going to look at this morning. But let me just give you a little background information. As you recall, back in the book of Acts, chapter 16, while on Paul's second missionary journey, he founded the church at Philippi. As you recall, he was actually thrown in jail there along with Silas. Uh, God saw them. God heard them uh, praying and singing hymns at midnight, and God sent an earthquake and allowed the prison door to open. And as you know, the Philippian jailer came running in. Uh, ready to kill himself, ready to commit suicide because he knew the penalty if the prisoners escaped. Uh, so the Apostle Paul said, we're all here, do yourself no harm. The Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul responded, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you along with your household will be saved. So that was on Paul's second missionary journey. So Paul then went on to complete his third missionary journey. Then he made a visit to Jerusalem. And at Jerusalem, he was accused of uh, causing a riot, stirring up trouble, uh, teaching things that go against the uh, teaching of the Jews, and he was arrested. And then he was sent down to Caesarea, and Paul appealed to Caesar. The Apostle Paul felt he could never get a fair trial in Jerusalem. Things were stacked against him. So he appealed to Caesar. So then he was put on a ship. And he was heading towards Rome on a ship. He was caught in a great shipwreck. They were all beached and stranded on Malta. Then eventually, they all, uh, Paul and those with him that were going to Rome, they all got to Rome safe and sound. And there, the Apostle Paul is under house arrest, waiting for his appearance before Caesar. So we believe that's when the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to, Philipp to the Philippian church. While he was in jail, you might say under house arrest at Rome, uh, he was allowed to receive uh, visitors. He was allowed to have people come to him so Paul could teach them and talk to them. And many of his friends went to Paul and brought him provisions and so on. So that's the background of Philippians. What is amazing about this letter, as Paul writes, keep in mind, he's under house arrest. He's confined, but the gospel is never confined. Even if he's in jail, the gospel still goes out. And then we find that in this letter, I counted, at least I hope I counted correctly last night, the word rejoice and joy appears 14 times. So that's amazing. Here's Paul in the house of rest. Uh, things are not going too well for him, you might say. Uh, there's a lot of hostility against him. And yet, this letter has joy and rejoice 14 times. So let's begin now and try to look at chapter 1. And we'll focus especially on verses 3 to 11. So number one, let's read about Paul's gratitude for the saints. And by the way, in the title, I say appreciate God's people. We need to respect God's people. Uh, we need to show that we cherish God's people and that they are important. Why? Because we're all God's saved people. We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and God is working in us. And so that's why I've entitled the message, simply appreciate God's people. Paul appreciates God's people, as we see in this uh, paragraph. So let's go to number one, then, Paul's gratitude. So if you will, let's notice verse 3. Paul says right there, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. In other words, every time I remember you, I thank God. Always in every prayer of mine, I make request to God for all of you, what with joy. When I go before God's throne and I think of you, I pray for you. And as I pray for you, I do so joyfully. Paul remembers, although he had a very difficult and hard time at Philippi as he was arrested and thrown in jail and so on and so forth, Yet the Apostle Paul is grateful for these people who came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And presumably that company has gotten a little bigger since Paul left on his second missionary journey and is now writing some years later. So he gives thanks. Uh, let's see what they give thanks for. Letter A. Letter A. Notice verse 5. What does Paul give thanks to God for as he thinks about these believers in Philippi? Verse 5. For your fellowship in the gospel, for your participation in the gospel, from your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. 
So when Paul first entered in among them and some became converts, they were helpful. They encouraged Paul. They considered themselves partners with the Apostle Paul in spreading the good news of Jesus. And even years later, after Paul left, uh, they sent to him, they sent provisions. Uh, uh, we read about someone in chapter 2, uh, Epaphroditus, who came to visit Paul and help him out and be of assistance to him. So Paul has fond memories of these believers because they considered themselves partners with him in the spread of the gospel. And so Paul knows that God is working in these people. God, God is active in these people because they are eagerly and willingly trying to help him, support him, encourage him in the spread of the gospel. So I say in letter B, Paul is grateful for the fact that God is working in them. If you notice verse 6, Paul says, being confident. Paul has, has no misgivings. He has no doubts. Uh, that God is working in them. So he says in verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What Paul is teaching us here is that God is working in me, God is working in you, God is working in all Christians. And just think about that. The, the, the almighty God who made the whole universe who made all the millions and billions of galaxies in this universe, that same God who created heaven and earth is the God who's pleased to work in me, and he's pleased to work in you. So I have a few sub-points here. How is God working in us? One, uh, sub-point one there, he's working in us through the Spirit. By means of the Holy Spirit, God is working in us. So if you want to keep your finger in Philippians, just back up to Romans chapter 8, if you will. Romans chapter 8. So don't lose your place in Philippians. In fact, I'll put a piece of paper in Philippians so I don't lose my place, and I'll go back to Romans. Because there's no doubt many verses we could look at that describe how God is working in us Christians, but I just want to draw your attention to a few passages. So he works in us through or by means of the Holy Spirit. So if you're there, let's go to Romans 8. I want you to see a few verses here. Romans 8 and verse 14, for example. Romans 8 and verse 14 uh, the Apostle Paul writes here and says, For as many as are led, that's present tense, for as many as are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So we know then that all Christians have the Holy Spirit and all Christians being led, guided, and directed by means of God's Holy Spirit. What a blessing to have the Holy Spirit. Uh, now verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of adoption to, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So I'll just uh, end right there in our reading for now, but God's Spirit works in me. He leads me, he guides me, directs me. He oversees my relationship with God the Father. He, he reminds me, he, he helps me to understand that I am a child of God and I have the wonderful privilege to freely Go to God, my Heavenly Father, and even call Him just that, my Father. Uh, the Holy Spirit helps me to understand God's love and God's care and God's concern for me. So that's one of the ministries of God's Holy Spirit. So uh, some point number two there, God also works in us through or by means of the Word of God. So the Word, uh, if you will, go to 1 Thessalonians. Oh, excuse me, I missed the, the Galatians passage. Sorry, let me slow down. Let's go to Galatians. So let's stop in Galatians. Before we go to 1 Thessalonians, let's stop in Galatians. Galatians 5. I guess it would be helpful if I could follow my own outline, now wouldn't it? <laughs> Galatians 5. You probably know this passage. It's about the fruit of the Spirit. So God is working in us. I just want us to be impressed by what a wonderful thing it is, what a wonderful activity it is to have Almighty God, the God who created the universe, the God who saved us by the shed blood of Christ, to have that God, that awesome eternal God, the one and only God of the universe, the God of love, working in me and working in you. So let me read now from Galatians 5, verse 22. Galatians 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. 
So God has given me the gift of the Holy Spirit to work in me to bring about all of these qualities, all of these traits, all of these characteristics. And the last I knew, these qualities all go against my sinful, fallen human nature. And I know, too, that, boy, I like to be around people that are full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and kindness, and self-control, and goodness, and so on. Those are the kind of people you feel good about being around. And our world could use more people that are being um, transformed by God's Holy Spirit so that these traits and qualities are in their life. So God is definitely working in us Christians, no doubt about it, and God is working to bring about a transformed life. And who among us wouldn't want to have more love? Less hatred, less anxiety, less bitterness, less fretting and fussing, and just more love. More love for God, more love for others. And then we'll have joy and peace as well. All right, now let's go to the sub-point number two. God works in us through his word. So I have the reference here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So feel free to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 is the verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. All right, here we read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Here again, the Apostle Paul is giving thanks to these these believers, these thanks at Thessalonica and how they responded to the gospel. For this reason, we also give thanks to God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you. Wow, we all always should welcome the word of God. The word of God is a good thing whether it's designed to comfort us or challenge us or, or build us up in our faith in some way, the Word of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We should always welcome the Word of God, and these saints did, these people who uh, were not believers, they became believers when they heard the gospel from the Apostle Paul. They welcomed it, they received it as the Word of God, not as the Word of men. And then at the end of that verse, we read these words, which also, which also effectively or productively or energetically works in you who believe. Wow. We have not only the Holy Spirit of God working in us, we have the Word of God working in our lives to bring about our transformation, to change us, to mold us, to make us more like Christ so that God will accomplish His plans and His purposes in us. Well, now let's go back to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. So once again, that verse said, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, as a believer in Christ, God is not going to, you know, say someday, well, I'm tired of working in Cliff McCabe. I'm not making much progress with Cliff here. He's kind of slow to change, and God's not going to quit. You know, sometimes we, we get bogged down on a project, we have a hard time completing things and getting things done. I mean, we're busy, we have a lot of responsibilities, but God isn't going to quit. He will complete. The Apostle Paul says, I'm confident God has begun in you a good work, and I see that good work being fleshed out because you were so eager to help me and support me and encourage me in the work of the gospel. You want this word of the gospel to go forth, and you're willing to encourage me. I know God is working in you, and God, he's begun a lot. It's a good work. God is doing something good, wonderful, beautiful, amazing in my life and in your life. And God's going to keep doing it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until either we die and go home to be with the Lord or Christ comes back. God is going to keep working in us. Praise the Lord. I just want us to all be excited about the fact that God is working in me. Sometimes we take so many biblical truths for granted. At least I do. You know, we've heard them so many times. We say, oh, yes, I believe that. I believe this. Yes, that's correct theology. But so often we take these things for granted. We just need to be able to step back and... And say once again that God's great truths that he shows us by just be able to step back and say, wow, this is great. This is amazing. So Paul expresses his gratitude for believers. And let's understand that 
as believers, although we're all different, we have different gifts and aptitudes, we come from different backgrounds, we're all very different in many ways, yet the amazing truth is we're all one in Christ because God has brought us together through Jesus Christ and God is working in all of us. So let's keep in mind, we're all a work in progress. God isn't done with us yet. And that's how I need to see my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Yes, they are all a work of God, a work of God in progress. None of us, including myself, are there yet. We're not perfect, but God is working on us. And believe me, we all need God's work on us. All right, let's go to number two. So in this paragraph, the Apostle Paul expresses his love and concern for the saints. The Apostle Paul shows his love and concern for the believers in Christ Jesus. So I've uh, actually put in some quotes, some, some phrases we have right here in the next uh, two verses that I believe show Paul's care and concern for the saints. After all, the Apostle Paul was called by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. He received a very specific calling and Paul feels a great sense of honor to be able to carry out this ministry to preach the gospel and to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. And when these people become believers in Christ, Paul is grateful to God. He just thanks God for every believer. And he wants to be used by God to help build up believers, to help them grow in their faith, to help them have joy and peace, and just be able to do the will of God and to ultimately bring glory to the Lord. So now let's move on to notice verse 7. Verse 7. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all. Now what does that mean? I suppose what Paul is saying in that phrase, it's right for me to have this, 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 this gratitude to God for you, for your partnership in the gospel, understanding that God is definitely working in you. I, I have no doubt about it. So Paul says, it's, it's right for me to think this of you all because... Paul says, because I have you in my heart. I have you in my heart. That means you're, you're, you're close to me. You're dear to me. I love you. I'm concerned about you. I care about you. So Paul says, it's right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. He goes on to say, you are all partakers with me of grace. That's my second point, B, letter B. You are all partakers with me of grace. So I want you to, to, and I want myself as well, to see how the Apostle Paul is thinking of other Christians. It's easy for us to see other Christians and, and maybe to see their faults and their failures and their shortcomings and so on, but Paul sees other Christians as partners in the gospel. He sees other Christians as those uh, in, in whom God Almighty is working and changing them. And now he says, you Christians, you're near and dear to my heart. I have you in my heart. I have you in my affections. And then, and inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of God, you are all, all of you Christians, all of you believers, you're partakers with me of grace. Well, let's just think about that for a moment. You're all partakers with me of grace. So as Christians, we know that we have all become Christians through faith in Christ, and Christ represents the grace of God. God has brought us his grace, his unmerited favor to us in Christ Jesus. And through faith in Christ, we have all, you might say, become partakers of God's grace. God's grace revealed in Jesus, such that our sins are forgiven and we're right with God. Perhaps there's another sense that Paul has in mind here. Paul knows that he has been given God's grace in a very special way for the preaching of the gospel. So Paul understands he has been given special grace by God to go out and preach the gospel as an apostle to the Gentiles. And so as these Philippians believers help to support and encourage the apostle Paul in his work, then Paul is able to say, yes, you're all partners with me together in this special grace that's been given to me to preach the gospel. So let's see other Christians as believers who are all there together in the body of Christ by means of God's grace. We're all partakers of God's grace. Every last one of us. None of us get into the kingdom of God. None of us are enjoying God's salvation in any other way than by means of God's grace. None of us get in because of our works. <laughs> it's not that some, the worst of us, get in by grace, but some of the better ones, well, they, they snuck in by God's works. No, 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 no. All, everyone that's a believer in Christ is a believer in Christ and is a Christian and has God working in them precisely because of God's grace. All right, let us see. This is verse 8 now, letter C. 
Notice verse 8. Paul says there, For God is my witness, as he's explaining why he has these feelings of affection and care and longing. He says there in verse 8, Now, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. In other words, I really care about you. I love you. I, I want the best for you. Uh, as Paul says in Galatians, he says, I'm, I'm laboring hard for you uh, until Christ is formed in you. So Paul is laboring for the saints. He's writing this letter to build up the body of Christ. He cares about the believers. He doesn't just come in and see some converts and then forgets about them. Absolutely no way. Paul cares about the saints, and he says, I long for you. I want God's best for you. I want to see you growing. I want to see you full of joy and peace and unity and oneness. I want to see you uh, filled with humility and living under uh, the, the lordship of Jesus. So Paul prays. And says there, how greatly I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Now, point number three. Now he moves on to his prayer. His prayer. And this is the last section here, the prayer. Slide this over like that. Okay, The prayer. So I think Paul is showing his, his, how much he longs and cares for all of these believers now by going into this prayer. This is what the Apostle Paul desires. For these Christians, so now we'll look at verses 9 to 11. Here's Paul's prayer. So again, this is all under the general heading of the general topic of appreciating God's people. Appreciating our fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are worthy of our prayers. We should pray for one another. And notice how the Apostle Paul prays in these verses. So here's Paul's prayer, verses 9 to 11. So letter A. Grow in love. This is the first thing he prays when he prays to God. What does Paul think of when he prays for these uh, uh, believers? First of all, he's full of gratitude. He thanks God for them, and then he moves on, and this is what he says, verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. Wow. I guess there's, there's, there's no time in our Christian life when we can say that, well, I'm as loving as I can possibly be, and I don't need to learn how to love any more or any better. At no time can we say we've arrived in showing Christ-like love. So Paul says, I pray that your love, I suppose that's love for God, love for Jesus, love for one another. I pray that your love may abound, in other words, may overflow, that your love may be abundant, still more and more. In other words, yes, you do love and you've made progress, but you need to love more and more. And then Paul says, in knowledge and in all discernment, or in knowledge and in all understanding. In other words, as we show love, we need to love with the understanding of who God is. We need, we need to show love with an understanding of God's plans and God's purposes and God's will. Um, and I might just say that one of the ways we can think of this being applied is that we, we can love the sinner, but we don't want to love the sin. Uh, we don't want to be so loving that we're willing to just do anything to get along with people, even if it means sinning against God and going against his will. So Paul says, increase in your love more and more, but do so in knowledge, in the knowledge of God, and in all discernment, and all wisdom and understanding of God's plans and God's purposes, and so on. So I have some cross-references here. So I have now 1 Thessalonians 3. If you will, go there, back to 1 Thessalonians and I, I put this reference down because I feel like the Apostle Paul is saying the same thing when he writes to the believers at Thessalonica. So if you will, 1 Thessalonians, this is under letter A, grow in love, 1 Thessalonians 3, and let's notice verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 11. So often the Apostle Paul writes letters to churches and he's always encouraging them to love, to love one another, to grow in love. And to increase in your love, because that's the only way the church will stay together and, and, and be a witness for the Lord. So there, if you're there now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, notice verse 11. Now may God, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound, in other words, overflow in love to one another, and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness 
before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So again, the apostle prays for these Christians that they would grow in love more and more to one another and to all. And then he goes on to say, well, this is how we show holiness. This is how we show our, our real consecration to God. God is a God of love. He has shown his great love through Jesus. We've been saved by God's love, so God wants us to love as he loves. And then, if you will, notice uh, chapter 4. Just drop your eye down to chapter 4 and verse 9. Chapter 4, verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Notice that. Who teaches us how to love one another, or who teaches us and prompts us to love? God does. Love is of God. God doesn't look down on planet Earth and try to learn how to love from us. No, no, no. We learn how to love from God. God is love, and he has shown us his love in Jesus. So we're taught by God to love one another. Now verse 10. And indeed you do toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. So Paul commends them, and he congratulates them for showing love. But notice what comes next. But we urge you, brethren, that you may increase more and more. There's always room for improvement to love more and to love the way God loves. So back to Philippians 1 now, Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. Let it be. So that as a consequence of loving as you should and loving more and more, you may end up approving the things that are excellent. This is what this translation is. Approving or putting into action, demonstrating the things that are excellent. Uh, some other translations say pursue, pursuing what really matters, pursuing the important things of life, uh, uh, pursuing those things that are superior. So we might think of, uh, well, what's superior? What's the important things of life? God's will. Uh, remember uh, Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So the apostle Paul says, I want you to grow and increase your, in, in your love. Um, so that you may improve, verse 10, that you may improve the things that are excellent, that you improve the things that really matter, that you may spend your time doing God's will, pursuing God's ways, and uh, just putting, putting God's plan for your life into action. That's what's important. Um, our plans need to take a second, second seat, a back seat to God's plan. God's plan needs to be our priority. That, notice verse 10 again, so we continue now down to letter C, that. See, one thing leads to another. We increase in love more and more so that, as a result, we end up putting into action the things that are excellent, the things that are superior. We put into action the things that are most important, the things that really matter, and no doubt that would be God's will, living according to God's plan and purpose, so that, that, notice verse 10 now, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. In other words, that you may, some translations say that you may uh, be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. That we may be, you might say, unmixed with evil. Think of pure water, pure gold. We need to be pure. Purely and thoroughly devoted to God. Purely and thoroughly committed to the will and the ways of God. So we need to be pure or sincere, as this translation says, and without offense, uh, without harming others. Uh, if you want, let's look at uh, chapter 2, if you will. Just flip over. We're right here in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, if you will. Notice verse 15, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Well, verse 14, do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may become what? Blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. In other words, live your life so, so purely and, and, and with such love that no one can fault you. No one can point the accusatory finger at you and malign you and your character and malign the gospel. Live lives that show love. And I believe what Paul means by that is that we end up doing good. We do good to all people. We do good um, so that they have nothing bad to say about us and nothing bad to say about the gospel. I also have Galatians 6.10. You don't need to turn there. Uh, that's where the apostle Paul says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all people especially to those who are the household of faith. So we, we're supposed to grow in our love for one another and for all so that we may be putting into action the things that are excellent, putting into action God's will and God's plan and God's purpose for our life so that we end up living lives that are sincere and without offense, lives that are pure 
and blameless uh, so we don't hurt others. We don't harm others. We, we show God's love. We show God's uh, mercy and grace to others. We show the love and the compassion of Christ to others. And notice that Paul says, now I'm getting down to letter D, uh, we're supposed to uh, be sincere and without offense till when? Till the day of Christ. So Paul reminds us again, Christ is coming back. Live in the hope of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, coming back. He mentioned that back in verse 6. God is working in you, and God is going to complete the good work that he has begun in you until the day of Jesus Christ. Now we read it again the second time. We're supposed to grow in love, that we may put into action the things that are excellent, the things that are important, so that we may live lives that are sincere and without offense went to the day of Christ. We're always keeping our eye on the fact that our glorious and wonderful Savior, who loves us more than we'll ever know, is coming back. He's coming back for us because he loves us and cares for us. Wow. Never lose sight of Jesus the second. And then letter E, my last point this morning, letter E under Paul's prayer, live for the greatest goal. What's the greatest goal? Oh, the greatest goal is having the biggest bank account in the world. <laughs> the, the greatest goal is just knocking myself out and working myself to the bone to amass a huge amount of wealth. Now, now keep in mind, everything we have is a gift from God, and God should be thanked for all the material possessions. Make no mistake about it. But what's the greatest goal in all the world? And I'm looking at verse 11 now. Let's focus on verse 11 as we wrap up the Bible lesson here. Verse 11. Being filled. So Paul's describing Christians now in whom God is at work, transforming them into Christ-likeness. And what's happening as we grow? We're being filled. Filled by whom? By God. We're being filled. Notice that word filled. Not just a little bit full or somewhat full, but being filled, filled up. That's always a good thing. Being filled with what? The fruits of righteousness. Now, I understand some translations say the fruit, singular, the fruit of righteousness. Um, that's probably based on some older manuscripts. Some of the later manuscripts say fruits, plural. So we have a little different variant there in the manuscript tradition. But we're being filled with the fruit or the fruits of righteousness. Perhaps the fruit is righteousness itself. So we're being filled up with righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, which comes through, I believe, faith in Jesus. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus, God is working in us, transforming us. He's making us more and more righteous, uh, doing God's will more and more. And what is this to? To the glory and praise of God. All this work of God in me, all this transformation, all of this growing and increasing in love more and more, so that I put into action things that are excellent, things that are important, things that really matter. And I'm, I'm increasing in my, my a life of, of, of purity and, and, and living a life that's blameless uh, before God and before others. So that at the end of the day, my life is just full of the fruit of righteousness. So that God gets all the praise and God gets all the glory. So God is working in me. He's working in you. So he gets praised. So that my life, as it's being transformed brings honor in and of itself to God Almighty and others through my life. Uh, God wants to change me in such a way that God uses me so that others will come to glorify and to praise God, our Heavenly Father. What a wonderful goal. We're filled. We're being filled with what God is doing in us. We're being filled with the fruit of righteousness or the fruits of righteousness, which come by Jesus Christ through our salvation by Christ. It's all to the glory and the praise of God. That's why God saved me. So he would be glorified. He would get all the praise and the honor and the exaltation. So let's just keep that in mind. Let's appreciate God's people. We are that special group of people on planet Earth in whom God is at work in a wonderful and special way. Through his word, through the spirit, he's at work in us. And let's have that love and concern and appreciation for one another. We're all very different. We come from different backgrounds and so on. But God loves us and he's at work in all of us to accomplish his plans and his purposes that he might be glorified, and that he might be praised. That's the greatest goal of all, to live each day for the glory and praise of our Maker and our Savior. And let's unite our hearts in prayer. and Let's thank God for what he's doing in all of us, and let's uh, ask God to help us to appreciate one another in the body of Christ more and more. Lord God, we thank you for being able to study your word this morning. And Lord, we just stand amazed in your presence that you have chosen to work in all of us who believe in Jesus. And Lord, we need your work in us. We're all sinners. We're all saved by your grace. 
And we need the transforming power of the Spirit and your word. So, Lord, help us to appreciate one another more. And, Lord, work in all of our lives to help us to love more and more in knowledge and in all discernment so that we might put into action the things that really matter, that we might live lives that are pure and blameless until the day of Christ, and that our lives might be filled by your work in us, Lord, that our lives might be filled with the fruit of righteousness so that you will be praised and exalted and adored. So, Lord, work on us for your name's sake. And we again thank you that you're working in us, Lord. You won't leave us. You won't forsake us. You'll finish what you have begun. Your work is good. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <coughs> Amen.